So thank you all for coming to uh, Mobile Portland in our new space. Um, this, is a, this is rather remarkable. We, we started this group less than three years ago, and when we started, we had like 15 people there or something. So it's astounding to reach this point. Um, who here is this your first Mobile Portland meeting? Wow, a lot of people. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Jason. I am one of the people who have organized this group. Uh, so uh, if you are interested in helping out, please let us know. Um, for those who haven't been here before, normally we go through some networking and that sort of stuff um, before we begin. Um, so we'll do some introductions, uh, then we'll talk about some upcoming events, and then we'll get right into the presentation. Um, Mobile Portland is based on an international organization called Mobile Mondays. It meets um, in cities across the world talking about mobile technology and has been doing it for quite some time. We meet on the fourth Monday of every month. We're going to be meeting here from now on. This is our new location, thanks to Urban Airship and Bob Gore and all the people in the building for, uh, for putting up with us. Um, and uh, we're really excited about that. Great new space. Um, not only that, but this month we launched a uh, new version of the website where a lot of the videos that Seth has been recording are now available for people to go view some of the past um, events. Also, the slides are getting posted there. Um, and there's going to be more stuff coming to that site soon. Um, ability for groups that are also doing mobile related events to add them to the events calendar. Um, we also want to get to the point where companies that are doing mobile related technology in the corporate area will be able to add information about themselves and the products and services. They're offering so that there's a central place where we can find out about this. Uh, every time I turn around, I find out about a new company doing something really cool in Portland, <coughs> mobile related, that I wasn't aware was doing it. So, um, my personal goal is to make that no longer be true so that um, at least there's one place where you can go where, where you know that all of those things are happening. Some upcoming events. Um, uh, Launch 2.0, which is sort of an open networking um, social event. It's also one of the first opportunities for people to see uh, the new building, take a tour, meet people at Urban Airship. Uh, they're hosting it on Wednesday at noon. Um, and information's on upcoming. Um, you can go do that. Um, the Android group meets once a month on the second Monday of the month. And Don P. Don P. There is your contact for that. We're not meeting on the other time. <laughs> Come on. Seriously? No, 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 wait. So, for the last two years, the calendar event on upcoming has said Mobile Love Android Star. And you're not going to Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so join the Google group and you'll find out when they're meeting. Um, there's also an iPhone group that meets um, second Tuesday of the month, usually. Um, so, and. Um, I forgot to put it there, so I apologize. Um, Mobile World Congress. Is, is there anyone here going to Mobile World Congress? A few people? Okay. Uh, so, Urban Airship is going as well. Um, so Mobile World Congress is sort of the big international event for mobile-related activities. It's happening in the second week in uh, February, so there's going to be a lot of announcements made around that time. I'm not expecting a lot of people to drop everything to go to Barcelona, but I wanted to put it there so you knew like, when to watch the news cycles. Uh, for those who are right, like, there are a few open chairs if you want to grab stuff. Yeah, there's a bunch over here. There's a bunch on that side as well. Um, we also want to take an opportunity just to give people like 10 seconds if they've got job announcements or postings that, they, um, that they're looking for people for. So raise your hand if you want to shout out the job. Urban Airship is always looking for talented local developers, especially with uh, Android experience. Vertigo okay. Software is hiring software developers and US designers. Go to Vertigo on Google and look at the links that appear. Cedric Sky and Eugene is uh, looking for mobile developers as well. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hi. Uh, flight Sets in downtown Portland. Uh, if you're interested in doing some front end, uh, you want to let it go, I'll 
So we have a nice model for that. And not only is it in that way uniquely Portland, but it's uniquely Portland because of the fact that the urban growth boundary actually keeps people close. Right? There's no place where we could do something like this in Silicon Valley, it's too spread out. So that's the goal. Um, and with that, I wanted to solicit some help. Um, so these are the things that we're looking for assistance with. Um, people who have experience working with and creating nonprofit organizations, um, because we've never done that before. So it would be nice to have somebody, both from a legal perspective, um, or people who know lawyers who do this sort of work who might be able to um, assist with that, and perhaps you know we can figure out some way to recognize them for that or compensate for that on that front. I'm not sure exactly how that works. Um, but if you have some ideas in that regard, that would be awesome. Um, we're looking for, and not only the legal portion of it, but also people who have done this sort of stuff before who can talk about um, the pitfalls that they saw as organizations went from sort of loose-knit organizations that actually happen to be nonprofits to do the things that they want to accomplish. Um, we're looking for companies to basically sign up and say, hey, you know, if there was a device lab here in the city that we would use it, and these are the ways in which we would use it. We don't need much more than that, but we need to be able to show the carriers and show these people that they will do that. And also to go to have something that we can take to the city government as an example of the fact that this is actually something that they should get behind. Um, connections inside these companies. You know, if you know people who you think would be interested in helping sponsor this and making this happen, um, please let me know. I almost forgot. Um, there's a place in Vancouver that's done something similar to this, but the Vancouver government has actually helped fund it to the tune of $11 million. So we have a model by which we can, we can follow. That's not the route we're going here, and we're not looking for anywhere near that level of sponsorship, but we are going to have some costs in terms of building out the center, buying the devices, and probably hiring somebody to manage the devices and reset them and things like that. If you have experience doing that sort of work, it can give us some guidance on what it means to actually set up this facility where we're going to have a ton of phones and need to make sure that they all come back and that they get reset and things of that nature. Um, any guidance in that regard would be awesome. Um, and then we're going to, in the future, need help setting up the lab and things of that nature once we get the funding to do so. So that's the big thing. That's the thing that we want to accomplish this year. And we want to put Portland on the map when it comes to the mobile development. So if you're interested in helping out with that, uh, either talk to myself or you can uh, talk more people who are here, raise your hand. So Megan, Aileen, Brian, Liza, John, uh, please talk to any one of us. We'd like to get your names and email addresses so that we can start, and like how you might be able to help us so that we can start working on that. So that's it, that's what we're, that's our goal for 2011 for this building, for this community. And with that, I want to turn it over to Amber and Aaron. I'm so happy that they're here to talk about uh, Duoki. Is that actually the way I've been pronouncing it? Is that correct? OK, excellent. I forgot to ask ahead of time. Um, uh, their, the vision that they have for what this service can do is exactly the sort of things that they location-based services from being sort of these abstract things that fit only a niche to being the sort of thing that actually makes a big difference for people's lives. We've got these devices that know who we are, where we're going, who we're going to meet with, um, and there's no reason that they can't assist us in that way and avoid us from getting speeding tickets and things like that, or uh, texting tickets, as it were. So everybody, please welcome Karen and Amber. So 
the application storefront is very mature at this point. If you remember using an old crappy phone and trying to download an application, it would take three to 10 minutes. It was really obnoxious. Now it's a frictionless interface. You can easily click and download it's there. So this, this great proliferation of these applications. There's this tremendous opportunity for advertisers and publishers. Um, the market's already enormous right now, but it's projected to be 2.5 billion in 12.5 billion in 2014, which is, isn't that far away. The technology is finally getting to be affordable and uh, in all sorts of phones. It started out that only a couple of phones had GPS, if they did at all. And now, you know, every iPhone has a lot of Android phones. So, um, investors are getting interested, advertisers are getting interested. Obviously, advertisers are getting very interested in location goals and advertising these targeting. Um, and finally, the, the marketplace and the, and the storefronts are being more developed now. Uh, there's a nice app store on Android as well as on iPhone. So things are things are finally able to be be found easier. Actually, be able to be found down easier. Yet in the current market, even though there is a tremendous amount of press, only four percent of online adults are using location-based applications. We'll go over into the presentation why that is and why that uh, might change in the future with the different types of applications entering the marketplace. So I'm going to talk about the history of the future because this sort of location technology has, is not unique to today. It's been going on for a really long time. It's just been very expensive. Um, and it's been relegated to academic institutions and inventors. Only a few people have it. So this guy's name is Steve Mann. In 1981, he said he was sick of many over to use computers and he would rather wear them. So he started building wearable computers. And when he went to school at MIT, he carried around 80 pounds of computer equipment every single day. And it took him an entire year to make a friend with somebody well enough that they would also don this computing equipment. <laughs> <laughs> he said that over time, it's not a big deal. Everything that I'm wearing right now will be in a little handheld device and everyone will carry it around with them won't be a big deal. And his friend was like, well, you're totally crazy, but this looks like fun. <laughs> so what he ended up building into his heads-up display, his wearable computer, was a, a proximal notification system where he could leave himself a note in a place. So here, actually, his wife, Betty, is leaving him a note at a grocery store saying, remember the milk. So this is the first evidence of remember the milk in a, in a location-based application. The problem is that this cost $500,000 to develop, and the other thing is that we're all really into augmented reality, but the thing is he uh, had something called diminished reality, where he took out reality. He said, I walk around the streets and other people's messages are in my face. Why don't I have my own messages in my own face? And so he had this heads up display, calculate rectangles, and provide text messages on those rectangles. So now his wife says, Steve, you've gone too far because you can wash them through his heads up device. It says, turn left your face. <laughs> uh, I think this was in like 1995. Um, so uh, what ended up happening is, yes, indeed, it got very small, and, and he looks slightly normal now in this last frame. <laughs> 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 Uh, the heads of displays in his glasses. He has a Twiddler device that allows him to type while he walks down the street. I think he wrote his thesis like this, just walking down the street normally. And now uh, he has a kid, and, and there's barely any noticeable uh, technology except for a large puppy microphone on the side of his face. But he can do all this illusion based um, uh, communication uh, now. And yes, everyone has this in their pocket today. So this is kind of a history of the future. In, uh, in 2006, there was uh, some research done at the University of Minnesota where they actually developed a mobile app for doing uh, location-based reminders and tested it out on some really motor old phones. And it, it was functional. It could tell where they were and what were messages were based on the context. But uh, it didn't really, it wasn't an app they were kind of selling or anything. It was research done, a research paper. And this was actually posted on uh, or a blog, uh, or a I think it was, and the comments that people were saying were just ridiculous. People were like, why are you wasting your time doing this thing, you're wasting money on this, why don't you build a real app, why don't you do something real? You guys are just wasting, wasting time. So clearly, uh, the clearly market wasn't ready in 2006 for this type of technology. So location today is 
today is just beginning to uh, be feasible. Uh, the timing is finally appearing so that everything has it in their pockets. It's uh, the hardware is there and it's affordable. So, so now it's finally feasible. Um, so this is this is good news. Uh, a couple of years ago, I tried to set up my own um, location-based reminder system and, and check it and tracking system. And I was experimenting with different ways of doing this. Uh, I didn't have a smartphone yet, so I just had like, one of the candy bar phones. Uh, so no help using that at all, because you couldn't, you couldn't talk to you know, Verizon and ask them to use the location of the device. Um, there's no way to install an app on it. So I started looking for other ways to do it. And SparkFun uh, is an electronics uh, hobbyist store, online store. They have a lot of parts and kits and things that you can, you can get. So I, I got something from them that had like a GPS chip and it logged to the SD card. Uh, I didn't have any wireless capability because that would cost an extra like three hundred dollars. So I didn't have that much to spend on this. So I just got the, the basic model and started playing around with it. And it found it to be not at all what I was hoping it was. You know, it took like a minute to figure out where it was. Um, there was no screen. There was just a couple of blinking lights. So if it was blinking, that meant it couldn't yet find the satellite to turn solid. So you really have no idea what it's doing. Um, and then finally, once you do get a lock, it's on the SD card, and then you have to go download it, take the card out, plug it into a computer, and figure out what to do with it after that. And I was like, there's no way, that even if I really wanted to, there's no way I'd be able to keep up on this project. So I dropped that idea, and then uh, a couple months uh, a couple months later, finally, uh, my contract was up for us, so I went and found an actual smartphone. And at this point, there were only a couple of phones on the market that even had a DPS chip in them. So I made sure to find one of those. Uh, and now it, it's great because I mean, now now I had a, a phone with the GPS hardware and it was, had always on the internet connection. So I started at that point uh, logging my location and where I'm turning turning it on all the time. It logged internally and also sent it to my server. So I started being able to do uh, to use the live position to do things. So the uh, I don't know.
uh, another thing that made it fun is that we could go and you know, go on jogs and camping trips and hiking adventures, and then we could look at the GPS logs and see where we went, you know, and see how long we spent time in the hot springs, and see how long we were asleep, and see how long it would take for us to run around and have a taper and put through this. This was the first day I was able to walk again, so I said, let's go up and hike the entire Mount Taper again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we made it through the fall, right? So, um, so that's always been fun, just, just visualizing the, the data that is already in your life that you can't even see. It's a great data portrait that you suddenly get out of it, especially as the data builds up over time. So we're going to shift gears into the current players. So who is doing location-based applications? What are they doing? What are the setbacks? What are the awesome parts of, of what they're doing? Why are they cool? Uh, so there are some issues first that remain before location is fully adopted. Uh, one of them is that every time you check in or use one of these apps, currently there's a social punctuation that happens. You go to a place, you say, oh, I have to check in. You look at your device, you check in. And if you're in a crowd of people who also checks in, it's great. But if you're in a crowd of people who doesn't, they're like, what are you doing? You're always on your phone. I hate when you're always on the phone. Why are you looking at me and talking to me? This is so obnoxious. You're so rude. You know, things like that tend to occur. Um, also, the, so along with this interruption of social flow, there's this sort of check-in exhaustion that people are talking about. They're like, this is really fun, we love the game mechanics, but wouldn't it be nice if we could just get checked in automatically? That would be a relief. Um, so, of course, everybody probably knows about Foursquare. You check in, you get points. Uh, it kind of reminds me of going around the block and you know a dog will pee on a, a street hydrant. <laughs> in doing so, he will claim his territory and say, I'm here, and we'll get points. And then if another dog comes up and says, hey, this person was there before, he's currently the mayor. Would you like to challenge me? <laughs> and the dog says, of course I'm going to challenge him, and gets points. And then, you know, and, like, and, and it works very well, because humans are very animalistic, and it's, it's excellent. So people get very excited about this. Of course, it's a, it's a different demographic that gets more excited about this than others. <laughs> so Please Robin uh, was a website that was put up uh, in direct response to things like Foursquare, where the idea was if you're if you're checking in on the internet publicly and saying I'm at this coffee shop, it means you're not in your house. So it was it was set up to point out the the fact that people are telling everybody that they're not home. Uh, obviously, it was just you know a, a stunt. It was only up for a little bit, but. The point was to raise awareness about what people are actually doing by publicly broadcasting their location. Uh, well, it's another clear in the area. It's, it's a beautiful application. It, also, you get you know, little uh, rewards, you can collect uh, items, you can go on little um, you know, adventures where you go to five places in a row and then you get another type of badge. It's, it's beautifully designed. The experience is wonderful. It's, it's not as insane and frenzied uh, as, as Foursquare, but it also doesn't have the adoption of um, it was later to the market, and it released its API later than Foursquare did, and therefore it missed out on a lot of developer opportunity, a lot of integration with other apps in the space. A lot of the, a lot of what happens with these online social networks is, is, in the social networks, you get a clump of friends. You can friend people on Facebook, you can friend people on Twitter, uh, on Foursquare, but in real life, you actually have a lot of different groups of friends that are totally separate from each other. They would never interact and never see each other. Maybe work friends or college friends, or um, and and then, but what's happening online is that everybody gets just pushed into a big pot. So a lot of a lot of people are talking about ways to address this now. And you know, Facebook has come out with ways to group people together to publish information to specific groups, which is a good start. <laughs> but one thing that people aren't really addressing is the notion of relationships that are very temporary, such as when you are meet, meeting a client. Uh, for coffee somewhere, or uh, you have a brief window of you know 30 minutes before the meeting where you would probably feel comfortable sharing your exact location because you're on your way to meet. So for that very small window, there it's okay for them to know it's very personal information of where you are. And then after that window, you would never want them to know. But that's not able to be represented anywhere right now because because if you friend somebody on Google Latitude, then you're always going to be on Google Attitude. You can stop sharing on Google Attitude, but then you stop sharing with everybody. And you can start sharing again, and you share with everybody. And Google Attitude also doesn't have many battery options or any different types of rates that are happening. Uh, you know, once, yeah, so once you're friending, you're friending you know, forever, and then you can't just, you know, 
you have to remember a lot of things. Um, it, also, there's some bugs where people will try to find each other a lot and it won't actually go through. And they'll, there's some there's some issues. Oh yeah, I had a pending friend request from Greenfields, and no matter how much I wanted to be friends with them, I just couldn't do it. <laughs> Echo Echo tries to uh, solve this problem um, by offering a very simple application where it says, "This person would like to see your exact location right now," and you can say, "Yes, sure." Hit the button. Same with uh, Marco uh, for Marco Cole. It's another app that does the same thing. Um, and then for that point in time, you see that person's location, and then it goes away. So it, it's kind of like a you know echo location in in the fog. You see where they are, and then the fog reappears. It's very safe and, and private, and very temporary. Uh, a lot of what we've been discovering is this. Is <coughs> when, when cell phones try to track, they often get a rough fix from the cell phone tower location. So they'll start out by saying, okay, you're here, and then they'll go find a real place once they can spend a little time figuring it out. But what, what ends up happening is, if, is you have to know whether the location of the port is accurate or not, because if you're trying to figure out where on campus at you know, UC Santa Barbara you are, and it actually says you're way up there, it's not very useful. So applications that are based solely on the rough location um, they work to get you within the city and to know what city you're in, but not down to a uh, street level. So Location, Location Labs is a, is a company that's gone and partnered with carriers to get access to the location, the cell tower locations of every single phone on the network. So now developers can go there and get access and find for access to access the location of any phone, no matter what phone it is or what uh, carrier they're on or what hardware they have, because the cell phone carriers always, always know which cell you're on. So at least you get a rough location now. Uh, another uh, kind of gaming platform is called Scavenger. Uh, they're really interesting because they allow a lot of businesses to come in and say, hey, we want you to have a location-based game, uh, trivia, you know, some sort of scavenger pond, something that goes along with this location. Um, and developers can build upon it too. Um, but the issue is that they have this scavenger branding along with it, so it's not just a, a normal SDK that they can just use to, to build their own applications. Um, but it's, it's been very successful. Uh, Seth, the CEO, is 20 years old and he's going to keynote at South by this year. Um, so it's just a very fast, uh, frenzied um, uh, company that has a lot of big partnerships. Uh, Waze is actually a really great application of, of collective location sharing because everybody says, okay, I'm going down the road, and it makes it very easy to report. There's a traffic jam, the, tra the traffic is slow, here's an alternate route that I like to take. And then people who are in, within the vicinity of that area, they can take alternate routes in real time around that traffic. So I used this in LA for a cab driver when it was really crowded out. And I said, go this way, go this way, go this way. And he said, how do you know this area better than I do? And he said, well, there's 100,000 people recording to this right now. Um, it also has a Portland connection. Deanne Eisner works there. And uh, uh, she also did Palatial a few years back, uh, which was another really great place-based uh, um, development. So what are we trying to solve? So, so this is this is kind of the things that we're passionate about and, and kind of the issues that we've come up with that we're trying to kind of work around. So there's an issue. If you schedule a meeting, for instance, and it's at 3 p.m., you say, okay, great, it's going to be at 3 p.m. because you know it's a week out, and then you know, when you score on the calendar, you're just very optimistic. But what happens is there's this period of, of you know 30 minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes of uncertainty. At Intel, they call it plastic time because they can go like all over the place, you know. And it's kind of like waiting for a bus to come, but you don't have one of those cool apps that tells you when the bus is going to come. It's like I'm sitting here, and the bus might come or not come. And it's very, very stressful mentally because you, you say, can I hang out this phone call? Uh, do I have enough time for a 15-minute project? Have they even left their house yet? Are they stuck in traffic? Do they know my phone number? Did they get the email? Are they going to be here or not? Um, so, so one of the, the issues is that um, there's all this texting that goes back and forth. You know, I'm five minutes away. Five minutes is any amount of time. Or you know, I'm stuck in traffic. And if I'm sitting here trying to you know drive or bike or something and then trying to get a message over saying I'm gonna be a little bit late. It, it, if at all, if I'm lucky enough, I'll be able to get some message out that says I'm five minutes behind schedule, but that's not accurate at all. And I may not even be able to get that message out. So these messages can be eliminated if you just know some, where somebody is. So, uh, for instance, if he sent me uh, a live update map of where he was on his way to see me, then I could say, oh, I know where he is, I can watch him in real time, and I do have 15 minutes to go downstairs and get a bagel because 
because I'm really hungry. And he'll be there, um, and that's great. Or I can see that he's having trouble parking, maybe I can you know, wait a little bit longer, or, you know, something like that. Um, also, if you don't want to have to look at a map, or if the person doesn't even have, uh, for instance, a, um, a smartphone, so they can't watch a live update in you know, mobile view map, uh, this proximal notification will just say, you know, you're 0.5 miles away from Eric. And then you know it's five minutes away. And then you know you just do your normal things up until that point. And then you know it means there. And then you can just you know, have a meeting. So it reduces um, all of this action of you know, where here I am, here this person is, and all these queries. When are you going to be here? Did you get the meeting reminder? Did you have my email address, things like that. So um, there was a, a great location conference that I encourage all of you to go to called WhereCamp. Uh, in WhereCamp 2008, um, I gave this impassioned speech about the future of location. And I drew this quadrant system on the board of Portland, and I said, everyone will have a GPS-enabled phone, and when they get into a quadrant, they'll get a text message saying, welcome to, you know, Northeast Portland, or cases in, you know, Northwest <coughs> Portland, and then geo RSS feeds will be everywhere, and, and only the information that you're subscribed to based on your actual location, based on you and your preferences, will be given to your phone in real time. Fantastic. And then, then I was like, somebody is working on this right now, and I know that somebody's working on this, and I wish that I could work with them on it, but it's going to be a well long dispersion. Um, and I called it some awkward name like auto subscribing geolocal or assessing. <laughs> 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 and at about the same time, um, I was working on this system, basically. Uh, totally unrelated. <laughs> I had no idea anybody else even was interested in this. I just thought that it'd be fun to, to draw a circle on a map and have things happen when I entered them. So uh, I, was just, I was doing this with my phone that I just recently got. Uh, and this is the circle that I have around Portland. And so there's one for every quadrant, there's one for downtown, and there's like a finger change, and it goes all over the place. So then when I enter a, when I enter a, a circle, it says Aaron's in Southeast Portland. Or if I go across the bridge, it says uh, Aaron's on the, on the first time bridge. So I got this GPS tracker when I was in New York. I came back to Portland and I start driving around with it. And lo and behold, I get these messages. Case is in Northeast Portland. Case is in Northwest Portland. Case is in, on the Burnside Bridge. It's the exact same thing that I've been talking about. It, it was great. Um, it was fantastic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, was, uh, I was actually at this point in living in a house in Eugene with a bunch of people on set up uh, an extend system in the house so that whenever I would get home, the lights would turn on, or if I would leave, the lights would turn off. I'm automatically checking myself into the house, basically. So this is this is now set up at the house here. Um, but what ends up happening is sometimes if you leave the GPS tracker on, as you saw in one of the slides, it goes like this. And sometimes it gets a cell tower uh, uh, <laughs> triangulation. And before we got rid of those errors in the system, um, it would suddenly check us out of the house. <laughs> and all the lights would turn off. <laughs> and then, when it retrangulated and happened to be inside the circle, all the lights would turn off. <laughs> and so we'd have to send a text message to the house saying, turn all the lights. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole idea behind this is that your, your phone, whether or not you press a button, becomes a remote control for reality. The buttons become things that you walk into. Um, you know, so like a, you can walk into a mailbox, you don't have to press a button, there's, there's location triggers that happen. So speaking of walking into mailboxes. Geonodes are uh, another circle that I have on this map, and I set up a way that anybody can put a circle on my map and type a message, and then when I get into that circle that they have defined, I'll get a text message with their messages. So they can start leaving messages for me around town instead of sending me messages. And also there's a, a, a little meter thing that says, how likely is Aaron going to be able to get your message? Based on the last 30 days of his location history, how likely will it be that he will get the message? Um, so then you can just go around without knowing his actual location and where he is to, to see where he's likely to get um, So this became fun. The other thing is that you put your email address in and you can see when the, when the notifications get picked up. So I started leaving all these notifications. Um, so for instance, um, actually, all that started doing is I showed back to one. One use for these 
geonotes that we started uh, discovering is that you can leave notes for yourself at, for example, the grocery store. So let's say you go to grab a flashlight uh, and it's out of batteries. And you're like, oh crap, well, let's get some batteries and send them at the store. And you're like, great, I'll remember that, sure. Uh, <laughs> and maybe I'll even write down on some paper, right? So then if you're at the store in the morning and you're shopping for breakfast or something and you're getting milk and eggs, and the last thing on your mind is the flashlight, and you open with your own piece of paper in your pocket, so you throw the batteries and you get home and you realize it. Again, because it, it's it's a uh, it's context space. So the batteries are when you're thinking. You need you really need batteries when you're thinking about batteries. You don't know when you're not thinking about batteries. So instead, you leave a, a geo note over the grocery store that says, "Don't forget to get batteries. You, you need it." Then you get a text message when you get them. So the great thing is you don't have to spend five hundred thousand dollars or be a Steve Madden type guy at MIT in order to get the milk notifications. So I started using these in San Francisco. Um, I would leave a note for myself there the that said, "Welcome to San Francisco. Take this bus to this destination." And then at that destination, when I was supposed to get off the bus, I would leave a note that said, "Get off the bus now. You're going to miss your stop." <laughs> so I would just sit on the bus relaxing, and then I would get the notification. Uh, and then the other thing is that once I got off the bus, it wasn't about when I got off the bus, but where I got off the bus. Uh, then I would get a notification that says, here's the address that you need to go to. You go down, it's, on, it's the house on your right. And I looked at it on Google Maps Street View, so I knew what it looked like. Uh, and, then I, and then I would get this push to me. So the difference between my airport experience usually is I'm digging around, seeing what transit I need to get on, and then I'm digging around, seeing what type of address I need to go to. And this, it was just just-in-time information that was just pushed to me. Here, go to this house. Okay, you're there. It's very relaxing. So you can do other cool things with ambient location. Uh, this is this is our tangent point where we talk about all the sorts of neat things you can do with location. So in uh, in Eugene, I was living in that house with uh, six or seven people, and um, we had a private IRC channel set up, so we could talk to each other in the house. It was encrypted. So then I uh, then I set up a chat box. To live in the and I gave him a calculator, and I gave him a timer, uh, and then I gave him control of the light switch. So I gave him the control of the next channel. So now in in the IRC room, I can type "Let there be light," and then the light switch went on, right? So then I took the GPS uh, the GPS phone that I was carrying all the time and sent a message from that into the IRC channel. So now I can control the lights from the GPS phone, or if I can get a text message from the phone in the IRC channel. <coughs> so then I have other outputs. So in addition to being able to control the lights, I gave the bot a way to control the music player in the house, or gave them a way to speak in a speaker in the kitchen. So now, from any of these inputs that I can feed into it, I can get the, any of the outputs. So I don't have to worry about how to get the thumbprint sensor to tweet, or how to get the temperature sensor to talk, because all I have to do is get the temperature sensor into the IRC channel, then you can send a text command, and the text command will figure out how to do the rest. So one of the funny things that I, uh, I noticed with the temperature sensor that was running in the house was uh, anytime anybody would start cooking in the kitchen, the temperature would shoot up about 10 degrees uh, pretty quickly, because the stove was on and it was heating up. So I was like, hmm, I can use that at home. So I, I, taught the, the bot to recognize that jump in temperature. And then as soon as he recognized that, he would make some comment on the speaker in the kitchen. Like, mm, that smells really good. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's in there? And he would freak everybody out. So like, how does the computer know that I'm cooking? <laughs>
no experience in iPhone development. You know, I, I, I come from a web background, so we luckily were able to get people excited enough that they really wanted to contribute. I only have a couple in the room here that have helped out with the app, so I just want to say thanks again for everything you guys have done. Um, it's been great, and, and we've been really excited to like, take off from that. So, yeah. yeah. It's been an amazing learning experience. Really, really good. Uh, so, welcome to GeoWorking. So, here's a sign in screen. Uh, you can sign up or you can use uh, it anonymously uh, from the screen. Uh, so, the first thing you get is a map screen, and this shows your location for the past two days or so. Um, also, if you park somewhere and you forgot where you parked your car, you can actually see where you parked your car and get back to it really nicely. Um, if you're trying to get directions around a town and you don't know what cross street you're on, if you just look at your trail, you can see it. Um, there's also a check in once button on the left. If you just want to check in once without sharing your complete location or real time update, uh, you can anonymously track and still share your location with people anonymously without them knowing who you are. Yeah, you don't have to, you can hit that anonymous button when you on the same screen, you don't even have to give an email address or anything. You can just jump right into the app and start getting it. So. If you want to send or share your location, just press the button and then you can set the amount of time that you want to share. Um, and then wherever you want to share it with, you can copy the link or you can send it to Facebook. And it'll pop up a little square with your location on Facebook. Um, and then once the location time is up, it will expire and then nobody else will be able to get to it. And it'll say, sorry, this person's no longer sharing their location. Um, and nobody else that you know has to have this app because they get a mobile app uh, or a web app. So if they're on the web or on a smartphone, they can see it in real time. <coughs> uh, we have a way to leave GeoNotes within the app as well. So you uh, position the little kid where you want to leave the GeoNote, and then hit the button and type in your message, and then you'll get it uh, once you get there. You can leave them from the web as well, and other people can leave GeoNotes from the web too. So. And then the, the tracking controls. We wanted to have a, a lot of uh, options for people. So there's there's kind of the simple options, which is you know you can turn on tracking, uh, you can check in once, or you can have three battery options. There's the battery saver mode, which uh, contacts the server every once in a while. Uh, the high resolution mode, if you want a really nice trail, or you, you know you're meeting somebody but you're only turning on for maybe 30 minutes, uh, it doesn't really detriment your battery. Uh, and then custom, so you can set the sliders any way you want. Uh, we actually have three sliders on there that you can't see, but it lets you choose, it lets you adjust the app in, in terms of how often you want to talk to the server, but also how often you want to log points. So you can choose to get really nice smooth curves going around corners, or you can just every now and then log a point. So the other thing that we have is, is called a layer, and this is where the, the geolocated content comes in. You can build your own layer with the GeoLock API, and then we'll have a, a way to actually build it if you're not a developer. Then you can just put in content. It's basically making a bunch of geodes that people can walk into. Um, for instance, we have, uh, as an example layer, this USGS earthquakes. So depending on where you are, uh, you'll get uh, earthquake notifications in real time on your phone with how strong the earthquake was, and where it was, and what depth it was. Um, so you'll get, uh, you get text messages when there's an earthquake within like 250 kilometers of wherever you're currently. So if you go to another city, you'll start getting notifications from that area. And if you go to California, we can just place a lot of them. <laughs> the other thing that we'll have is, is this uh, automatic four square checkings. So you can just put it on and in the background as you walk around, it'll just get checked into your favorite locations on four square in the background if you've been there for more than 10 minutes. So the app is built using the Geolocate, the iPhone SDK, and then it talks to the server using the API. And the iPhone app itself is, uh, I like to think of it as an example of what you can do with the, the power that the server gives. So mo most of this logic is happening on the server and can be used in other applications besides this app. So the SDK lets uh, other apps be built on top of the API. You could also write an Android app using the API, it's just an adjacent interface. Um, you can write web apps or anything, anything, anytime you want to uh, record location data and store it or trigger actions based on uh, being in or leaving places. That's uh, that's all handled by the API. Uh, so one of the other things that we're looking at is geocoded Wikipedia articles. Marshall Kirkpatrick was like, I really want Wikipedia articles to show up. 
uh, based on where I am on my phone, it's pushing our and, and so we started looking into this. Um, and, and so there are actually a ton of geocode Wikipedia articles, and somebody, I think, linked to from Yahoo Fire Eagle that talked about this a little bit, and they actually have done a bunch of the work, so we just kind of take this out and we throw it into, into a layer and uh, you know, set the settings so that you get you know, some interesting push notifications of, of what the are. So I kind of you know, turned it on to test it out, and I got this really tall building in southeast Portland that I never knew about. I started hunting around and looking for it. It was really interesting. So it's kind of the basis of a, of a trivia layer that, that works globally because there's so much uh, Wikipedia content. This is an example of uh, how these different pieces might connect. Uh, you can build an app using some data source like PDX API, would be a great example, um, using the, the data sets that City makes available, and take that data and push it over to GLOP API, and then your app will get triggered whenever somebody moves into that area. Um, and then you could use the Troco API to send a text message or make a phone call or uh, start an IM chat uh, over there. And then uh, the instant app rating right, is actually an app that runs on Blackberry, and Android, and they have an iPhone app as well. So a lot of platforms, uh, they have an app for a lot of platforms. It's a really basic tracking app that just does the tracking bit else, but we can actually feed that into the geo of the API. So we have a BlackBerry, um, we don't have a BlackBerry app yet, so you can use some effort to start tracking, and then you can at least use GeoNotes on the web page and subscribe to players, so we can this all based on text. So we started building some more example apps on top of it. We went down for, uh, to Palo Alto for Science Tactic in California, and we made this thing called Science Trivia Walk, which we walk around, we gave a bunch of sample little locations, um, and then we got a group of people to install, you know, Instamapper on their phones, all sorts of different types of phones, and they started walking around and they got these pushes of, hey, look at the building on your right, you know, what year was it built in? And everybody started looking around and then they text messaged back and said, oh, it was built in this year. And they got a response of, like, you're correct, you got 2,000 points, or you're wrong, you got zero points. And they were like, ah, oh, darn. And so we started walking around. It was very exciting because there was this sort of sense of wonder you know, back in the world, like, wow, the world is interesting. We're stopping to look at buildings instead of our devices. Um, so here, the app architecture, um, and then we had the, the basically the, the uh, leaderboard. We had all these different people playing and testing out the app. This was built in, I think, probably like 10 or 12 hours. We're at this little hacker shop, so just kind of like showing that an app can be built really quickly. Um, we had a Ruby programmer, and he did the um, the whole like storage and point system and integrated with all the different APIs that we're using. So it was a really fun experience. A Chattercast is another example of an app that we actually made in about six or eight hours, uh, where we took the real-time 911 feed from Seattle. So they have a, a feed available of any time a 911 call is recorded, gets pushed out. So we can take all of those and create uh, geonotes on a layer, and then you can subscribe to those. So anytime you go to Seattle, you get text messages and 911 calls that happen like right nearby. So you hear like a siren go by, and then you get a message. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> That was pretty fun. Um, that was that was during a, a triple hackathon up in Seattle, and uh, that was that was the first time that we really used the GeoLocky API to build an app really quickly. Um, then we had a GeoLocky developer challenge, and Rebuilds made this app called Don't Eat That, <laughs> and he took uh, <laughs> open up the data. Took the uh, restaurant inspections data. So anytime you pass by a restaurant with a score of less than like ten. You get a message that says, don't eat that. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you could set you know, a threshold level, right? So you'd be like, if it's below 30, you know, and then, then you had all these snarky messages that would randomize. You just go by and be like, don't do that, or are you sure you want to eat there? You're crazy. And your phone would just have its personality. Um, so yeah, you got you to be surprised for that. Uh, it was a fantastic app. Uh, and then you built that in maybe like, uh, half a day. Yeah. Half a day yeah. so, Pretty good, can be built on. So, um, as a final conclusion, the future is going to be awesome. Uh, now you know a little bit about the location market and the history of the future, and a bunch of the different apps out there, and where we came up with some of the stuff and where we are now. And we hope to see you in the future as well, because if you're not, that would really suck. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, we've been seeing a much bigger response than we expected. So yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's definitely possible that this will uh, turn into a, a, a real business soon. It's, it's getting there. We've been on the phone with, yeah, people. <laughs> <laughs> Or we have to use them to build, build their uh, 
they're out of the cars too. Just had a question before. It's not really a question, just a comment. Yeah, that would be so. So uh, one of the things he said is having public note would be having public notes would be great, and then that's uh, under the category of layers. So layers are really public geo notes where you can just say, you know, you have a more important layer, like, you know, this is a timed uh, note, so it only appears on Thursdays, you know, or it only appears. You know, so you have happy hours with geo notes, walk around and say, in an hour there'll be a happy hour here.